Hey YouTube, it's Sebastian, KF5OBS. Today we're gonna establish whether or not you can use simple off-the-shelf arbitrary function generators to test the navigational accuracy of airband VOR receivers. Of course we'll have to talk about VORs first, what they are, what they do. Um, in a nutshell, most importantly before GPS came out, quite obviously airplanes needed some mean or another to navigate from point A to point B and uh, one of those navigational aids used was a VOR. See a VOR marked in the sectional chart for where I live right here, it's this circle right here. And uh, basically it gives you an indication on uh, what radial you are from here in relation to magnetic north. So somewhere up here is magnetic north and uh, if you would fly along that heading, it's right here, you would see a zero. You see right here on the display it is showing about 337 which is about this line that I marked out in pencil so this is where I am in relation to this VOR right here this is actually a vortex you can see by the symbol down here but that's a whole nother can of worms now this map is very crowded so let me get out a different one and then let's talk a little bit about the basics how a VOR works what it really does and then we'll establish how we can manipulate a standard arbitrary function generator to test the accuracy of uh, one of these receivers right here. Okay, what we're looking at now is the Anchorage sectional chart and we're looking right here at the Johnstone Point VOR. This one is also DME so it can actually show you your distance to this VOR but uh, we really just care about the VOR function right now. As you can see here, here's your zero which is obviously magnetic. I mean you're your north up here is going to be your true north and this way around on the map you're going to have your magnetic north here you have the zero and uh, of course you have a bunch of, a bunch of other numbers around here and uh, plain and simple um, the uh, the uh, receiver in the cockpit of an airplane or in my case of this little handheld receiver will show you what direction you are in relationship to this VOR so let's say we were right here it would show 300 degrees you know this line right here just imagine the imaginary extension of this line out that doesn't matter where we are as far as this direction here is concerned um, it doesn't show us the distance and the distance to the VOR does not absolutely not influence uh, the reading we're getting of course this is assuming that we're within range of this VOR but this is basically it plain and simple we're getting an indication on what direction in relation to the VOR we are and as you can see by those lines right here those are airways those are airways uh, that lead airplanes from one destination to another and traditionally at the end of each one of those airways or at uh, interchanges and, and crossover points you'll see one of those VORs and uh, way before had we had GPS and other means of uh, aerial navigation you would use those VORs and they're still very important to date now how do they work the technology behind those VORs is amazingly simple. Um, traditionally, there used to be a rotating antenna that would basically rotate with a main beam direction 30 times a second. There used to actually be an actually physically rotating antenna that would be mechanically rotated at the VOR side. Nowadays, this is no longer happening. It's electronically rotated. But what it would do is you would see an amplitude modulation. Obviously, the antenna points at you, you're going to have highest amplitude. And it points away from you, you're going to have lowest amplitude. So you're going to get a 30 hertz amplitude modulated signal. Quite obvious. So what also makes sense is that uh, let's assume the rotation starts here, which it does at the zero degree radial. Uh, there's an airplane right here. Then there's an airplane uh, right here. It's quite obvious as the antenna rotates, this airplane right here is going to see the peak before this airplane does. So there is a difference in phase depending on the location where you are on the VOR. So cool, now we have a signal, a 30 hertz signal that is depending on our position towards the VOR. Perfect. Now we have a variable. All we need now is a control. And the way a VOR does this is really, really simple. And I drafted this out here. Let's see if we can zoom out a little and get on there. All right, perfect. So here's our 30 hertz 
generated by the antenna rotation. And down here is our reference. So we're generating a 30 Hz reference that is completely face locked to the rotation. So uh, the uh, signal is going to be zero as it starts at zero degrees. The face angle here is going to be 90 degrees as the antenna is at 90 degrees. One, if this is at with the 180 degree position, then uh, this one's going to have a face angle of 180 degrees as well. Quite simple, straightforward. This reference is FM modulated on a 9.96 kilohertz or 9960 hertz carrier. It's FM modulated. Very important. Now those two signals are mixed. Well, they're not mixed actually. They're added. Very important. And then a uh, a transmitter is amplitude modulated with it or more so this receiver is actually amplitude modulated by this signal and this signal right here is generated by the antenna rotation but what the receiver will see is a 30 hertz signal amplitude modulated generated by the rotation of the antenna and uh, in the same signal in the same amplitude modulated signal it will see a 9960 hertz carrier and if you FM demodulate this one this carrier just at the receiver side you strip out the 30 Hertz with a low pass filter and then you uh, strip out the uh, 9960 Hertz with either a band pass or a high pass filter and then FM demodulate this uh, this reference carrier you're recovering your original 30 Hertz reference and if you compare the 30 Hertz signal here and this one in phase the phase difference between the two directly corresponds to the radial that you're on. So if the phase difference between the two is 180 degrees, you're on the 180 degree radial. It's that simple. What you see down here is an identification. Um, it gives uh, its ID in, in Morse code. It's a 1002 hertz signal, which is also put thrown into the mix here. And uh, a couple of things, the modulation index for the identification is 7%. 7 the modulation index for both the rotation and uh, the reference carrier is 30 percent and uh, as the name implies this all happens in the VHF range 108 to 118 megahertz roundabout that's where all the action happens so now you know a little bit about uh, VORs and we didn't really talk about the specifics how they're used in the air and all that and that's up uh, to other experts to explain and uh, we don't really need to know that for the set task the only thing I want to throw in is uh, we're using this uh, little radio that I have which has a VOR readout for our experimentation. Of course the readout in a real commercial airliner looks a whole lot different uh, than a handheld radio like this quite obviously. It can get pretty fancy. Uh, one of my pilot friends which likes to remain anonymous uh, kindly supplied this image. Uh, this is a VOR readout that you would see in a uh, C-130 very interesting stuff and there's millions of variants. It gets really crazy, gets really fancy and it can be very simple. I mean this is about the simplest it can get but uh, it's uh, being in a C-130 it's of course already a little bit better equipment than you would find in a local uh, Cessna 172 or something like that. So anyway let's move on and uh, figure out how we can generate the signal with a uh, standard uh, arbitrary waveform generator. Well what we have to do is plain and simple actually. For once, we need to generate a 30 Hz signal that will simulate our antenna rotation. It's very simple. Every arbitrary waveform generator can do this. Then we need to generate another 30 Hz reference that we can control in phase compared to this 30 Hz signal. That's simple. Then we need to FM modulate a 9960 Hz carrier with this signal right here. And one thing I didn't mention yet, the uh, FM deviation here is 480 hertz, so fairly low. Now we need to take a combiner and uh, combine those two signals together and send them off to another channel on an arbitrary waveform generator that generates a signal in the VHF band and amplitude modulate this. So we need to take care that the amplitude coming out of the combiner uh, corresponds to what will generate a uh, modulation index of 30 percent so that's a piece of cake I didn't really bother about uh, generating an ident tone because uh, if I want to test that my receiver is uh, correctly uh, 
giving the audio that it's receiving, I can just uh, amplitude modulate. I can switch my, my waveform generator real quick to just generating an internal tone and amplitude modulated, and I can listen to it. I don't need any, I don't need to add complexity in this whole thing. So all I really cared about is uh, everything you see above my hand now. And pretty much any arbitrary waveform generator with the right bandwidth can do this. This down here is definitely no challenge. And nowadays, there's so many waveform generators available that'll uh, work in this range. Since they're mostly two-channel instruments, you probably need uh, two generators, but uh, given the cost, this shouldn't really be an issue. So let's look at the practical setup real quick. Here are my two generators that I'm using. I'm using a Rigel DG1022 and a Teledyne LeCroy Wave Station 3162. Uh, since this one is the higher bandwidth one, up to 160 megahertz, I'm obviously using this one. Uh, on the VHF generation side and I'm using this one here for uh, the lower side since traditionally those boxes uh, only have uh, one external modulation input I'm also using this one to generate our 9960 Hertz carrier here but one thing after another so right now I'm in the channel 2 menu channel 2 is the one on top here which is kinda counterintuitive you kinda expect channel 1 to be here and channel 2 to be on the bottom but in any case here we're generating our 30 Hertz signal which simulates our rotating antenna. If we switch over to channel 2 and actually go here, we see that I'm generating our 9960 hertz uh, signal. You see the modulation button is uh, lighting up, that means uh, I'm modulating this. And you're seeing it's, a, uh, it's has using an external source and the deviation is 480 hertz, just as in the specs. Very important. So uh, that's that. Those two signals are uh, going through this little uh, resistive combiner for many circuits, standard off the shelf, uh, into the modulation input of the uh, wave station down there. Um, for, for to that, this goes basically. This directly modulates the transmitter on the VHF side. So we're missing one thing, and that is the uh, input for the 9,960 hertz. Um, carrier of course this is amplitude modulated and it has an external source like we saw and this is coming from uh, channel 2 of the wave station you see this down here I hope you can see that and it's not too small Let's see if I can zoom in on that I don't think the light is very favorable for that 30 Hertz here on channel 2 of the wave station that's basically my reference which uh, goes out to modulate the 9960 Hertz uh, reference uh, carrier and uh, the other channel is my 109 megahertz which I chose uh, it's AM modulated and is being fed out of this combiner with the other two signals we just looked at uh, if this was too complicated and uh, too random for me to explain I apologize but uh, the uh, block diagram that I just showed you is pretty self-explanatory so the output of the wave station of channel 1 is uh, for once fed in the spectrum analyzer here next to me or rather the oscilloscope with spectrum function we're going to look at that in a second and also this uh, radio again uh, I used another attenuator here even though the level is only a 0 dBm uh, I just wanted to make sure that the radio uh, is fine with the input level but I didn't want to put the signal level too low for the oscilloscope so putting a 20 dB attenuator in here was a pretty cool idea now what you see right here is uh, it shows a constant 140 well 141 degrees kind of jumps between the two so that appears to be the phase difference between the two signals right now okay so uh, let me change the phase information here let's go to channel uh, to our reference now that's our rotating antenna sorry and type in a phase of 141 degrees now watch the screen what's gonna happen see it's slowly falling that's also very interesting to see that apparently uh, this type of receivers uh, consider very erratic and quick changes uh, not correct and which is obvious uh, you know your airplane is not just gonna jump a uh, hundred radials uh, within milliseconds so it seems like it's uh, kinda slowing down its response time there so now we got 359 and uh, if I would just uh, change this here by one degree we should be at an even zero there we go triple zero uh, well it's, it's, it's a little bit jumpy but it gives us lots of accuracy and if I wanted to I could now 
give us of course a 10 readout just to change 10 degrees we're getting 10 uh, 10 9 ish there and of course uh, we could do the same now now add a hundred oops I jumped around a little bit there let's see I don't remember what my setting was beforehand let's see what we're getting 100 there we go and just like that we can test the navigational accuracy of uh, such a high-tech instrument such an important instrument for uh, modern aviation still with uh, very simple off-the-shelf arbitrary signal generators and just for the fun of it let me reposition the camera and let's look at the signal on the oscilloscope all right and here we go I'm using the uh, HTO 4024 here uh, for uh, the spectrum display it's uh, really super fast on the spectrum calculation it's crazy if you compare this to other oscilloscopes and that includes uh, my new uh, Tech MDO 4104 here. Uh, the speed of the FFT is just insane. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, in the middle our 109 megahertz carrier, and then I have uh, 10 kilohertz per division uh, spacing here uh, in the frequency domain. And obviously we're seeing our carrier, and as expected because it's AM, we're seeing our two side loops, which are almost exactly 10 kilohertz uh, distant from the carrier. And to be precise, they're going to be on 9,960 hertz. It's going to be the spacing. And we can even calculate the width of, of each and one of those by just using Carson's formula. Uh, quite obviously, for any FM signal, you're going to have a bandwidth of, of about uh, two times uh, the maximum frequency in it, which is 30 hertz, plus your deviation, which in our case is 480 hertz. So everything together makes 510. That times two makes 1020 which uh, is a little bit over kilohertz and uh, that's gonna be the the bandwidth that you'd expect and that's not accurate it's not the 3 dB bandwidth or so it's just a really good gas formula uh, Google Carson's formula if you're not familiar with that so uh, that shows what a VOR signal looks like and by the way one thing I really hate is the reflectivity here I mean uh, it's very difficult to take any video from the scope screen and uh, honestly this uh, is the reason why uh, a few times before I have not used the oscilloscope in any video footage but I think I'm gonna start capturing the footage of the oscilloscope screen via HDMI and I just either throw that directly in the video or actually uh, mask the screen out and insert the footage again uh, just to make that video look better but in any case, um, the task of the video was uh, to use standard off-the-shelf arbitrary signal generators to uh, test the navigational accuracy and integrity of a VOR receiver, which we have proved we can do. We didn't use any fancy gear, we didn't use any super expensive uh, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollar type Rode and Swartz uh, IFR instrument testers or anything like that. Now obviously we probably wouldn't be allowed to do this in a completely FAA approved environment but if you own an aircraft for instance that is IFR certified and you have issues and you think hey maybe my VOR is uh, dysfunctional and you just do not have a reference station near you. Uh, on some of the big airports there are some, uh, some they offer a reference station where uh, basically you dial in the frequency of that reference station and uh, you get in a certain readout usually triple zero degrees and you can just make sure that your VR displays that if it does everything's good if not it's time to go to the repair shop but if you don't have something like this near maybe uh, this kind of uh, testing is sufficient for you to just get a functional non-functional indication and once you made the determination to uh, send this off to an FAA approved repair facility